Well, I have a very limited responsibility uh, this afternoon, and it's to greet all of you. My name is Jim Marshall. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, the Institute, uh, in essence, stops fights. Uh, we work globally to do that. We work with lots of partners. We've been in existence for about 30 years now. Uh, that we opened this new building about two years ago. It's a real calling card for the Institute. We're excited about being able to occupy the building. We're also excited about all the partners that we have around the globe working on trying to build peace, build stability, avoid conflict. And so that's what we do. And, and, and this is one of many programs that we sponsor in order to further that overall goal of stopping fights. Uh, and with that, what I'd like to do is call on John Park, uh, who was with the Institute for years and years and is sort of now part-time with the Institute. Uh, he's been the person that's been responsible for developing a lot of our dialogues uh, in, in the Asia Pacific area. Uh, and John and I recently traveled with, uh, he's, he's a, 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 a real asset to the Institute. Uh, we hope to keep him engaged as the years progress. And John will uh, have the task of introducing our panelists. And I don't know whether any moderation will have to be, uh, you know, moderating of this group will have to be done. But I guess John will try to do it if it's possible to be done. Uh, and, and with that, uh, welcome to all of you. John? Thank you very much. Thank you, President Marshall. And welcome all to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, it, it is my great honor to introduce uh, what I think is, in, in terms of a, a baseball analogy, an all-star team. Uh, we have a number of individuals uh, in the building, but particularly on this stage, who have the inside perspective on the operational uh, details regarding uh, many difficult, but also, uh, I think, positive developments in the region. And so today we have the opportunity to hear uh, some initial thoughts, and then I will be opening it up and leaving plenty of time for this audience to engage. One of the key objectives of this particular panel as a public symposium is to give audience members the chance to ask questions and really have this type of interaction with these individuals who have been uh, uh, former policymakers, uh, former senior policy advisors, and played a number of different roles in their respective governments. Let me start off with a brief uh, introductions. Uh, farthest to my right is Professor uh, Kunihiko Miyagi, who is a uh, former foreign ministry official of Japan and currently a uh, senior leader in the Canon Institute. Uh, next to him is Ambassador Chon Young Woo, who was a former uh, presidential secretary for foreign affairs and national security in the Blue House in South Korea. And to my immediate right, is Mr. Steve Hadley, who was the former uh, National Security Advisor in the second Bush administration. So let me just jump right into uh, the discussion here uh, and ask uh, Mr. Hadley uh, a framing question. When we look at Northeast Asia uh, and the uh, very complex challenges as well as uh, interesting opportunities, uh, there have been a number of very visible and prolific comments made about the rise of China, the different natures of the threats, uh, if you could frame for us how you see the dynamics among the parties in, in the region uh, and also the types of directions that you see the uh, trilateral partnership that uh, can go forward. Yeah, I, I think there's been um, a lot of talk about the rise of China. Um, the two presidents, when they met on the West Coast, President Xi Jinping and President Obama, uh, raised this theme that we've been hearing from Secretary Clinton and the former State Counselor Dai Bing Guo about can there be a new kind of relationship among big powers where they don't fall to confrontation and conflict, which has been the historical norm, but they can manage uh, competition and cooperation without descending into confrontation and conflict. Um, this is a good discussion to have. Uh, I'm actually, um, we can have a longer conversation, optimistic that that can happen. But I think it doesn't actually frame adequately what the situation is in Northeast Asia, which I see as an arena really of four great powers. If you look what Japan did coming out of the ravages of World War II, what South Korea did after the Korean War, to build these incredibly successful and prosperous societies. These are four great powers in, uh, in this part of the world. And the question is, that has to be talked more broadly, then what is the relationships between and among those powers? 
And one of the problems, of course, is the enormous burden of history that is carried uh, in, in, in the case of, of those four because of the wars that have occurred in this part of the world. Uh, I think the six-party talks with North Korea, while they have not produced the result we wanted in North Korea, have shown that the four great powers, if you will, including Russia, can cooperate on a common security problem. That's a very good, good uh, accomplishment and bodes well for the future. But I think it will not work on a sustained basis in the future if we are not able to address the underlining bilateral tensions between Japan and China, South Korea and China, but especially between Japan and South Korea. These are tensions rooted in history that are uh, stoked by nationalism and can be triggered by all kinds of events and cause crises that none of the countries want but none of them can avoid. And so I think one of the things, and, and for us, the United States, the point of tension that is the most difficult, oddly, is the tensions between Japan and South Korea. There's no more uncomfortable place to be than in the middle of a fight between friends. And so one of the things that I think is important about these kinds of track 1.5 dialogues like we've had today and that John has been such a moving force in is that it allows uh, people, in this case, the United States, Japan, South Korea, to sit around the table and talk in a more open way about the problem, the elephant in the room, if you will, and maybe a little bit more free to talk about how you begin to address uh, uh, some of these uh, situations. How do you manage them in the short run and, and uh, uh, dispose of them in the long term? Because there are real challenges we face in Asia today. To manage them, they are going to require us, all three of us, Japan, the United States, uh, and uh, South Korea, with China where we can, to work together to manage them. And uh, we have not, we've got to make sure that the history and the nationalism does not get in the way in the smart, the burden of the past does not prevent us from taking the smart actions that we need to ensure the future prosperity and security of our peoples, because that would be a tragedy. And I think one of the good things, as I say, about forums like this is it gives us an opportunity to talk about these issues and maybe over time uh, find some ways uh, to better manage these kinds of uh, tensions. So I applaud what you've done. I think the, the sessions have been excellent. But I think we've got to think a little differently about the challenge in Asia than is kind of out there in the popular press these days. Thank you I don't very know much. What my colleagues think about. Yeah. Ambassador John, the, the, the view from Seoul, if you could talk a little bit from your perspective. Well, um, I found this trilateral enormously uh, interesting and useful. I've been to many uh, uh, track one uh, trilaterals before in my uh, earlier capacities, especially as head of delegation to the six party talk, at the height of the six party talks. But we are, you know, in track one discussions, we are all bound by instructions. And uh, uh, we had uh, extremely candid discussions that we couldn't have occurred in other formats before. So with uh, all those coming to this trilateral in private capacities, it's very helpful. And we are not bound by, this is first trilateral. I'm not bound by government instructions. So I could speak my mind, you know, with all candor. So, and I think my Japanese colleagues, American colleagues, uh, uh, have done the same. In that regard, I don't think there is any uh, any other setting that we can have uh, such uh, uh, frank discussions on uh, the most fundamental issues that you know uh, that stand uh, between uh, between us. And uh, Ms. Headley, I understand your worry about uh, Korea-Japan relationship, but uh, 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 I think uh, Japan is the country 
a neighbor with which we share a broadest range of security interests. And we also share common values, uh, our common commitment to democracy, human rights, market economy. We don't have uh, this kind of relationship with any other country in East Asia. China is ec economically very important. And we have our own problems with, with China as well. Uh, but I think this is time, uh, the need for trilateral cooperation on issues of common interest in East Asia uh, is greater than ever as the uh, uncertainties about uh, st uh, strategic stability in East Asia uh, on the rise. So uh, we have, uh, as you uh, noted, fundamental problems to resolve. And I think there is a way we can uh, manage better relations with Japan. But as you rightly pointed out, the cost of history, that's what lies at the heart of the uh, tensions. I wouldn't describe it as tensions, but some uncomfortable relations from time to time. There are always ups and downs in uh, relations between Korea and Japan. And we have this kind of cycle for thousands of years. So this may be news to you, but uh, we have been living like this for many millennia, so it's nothing new. <laughs> but we know, we know how to resolve these issues and, and all, all it takes is for Japan to face up squarely uh, with its own past, come to terms with the past, and reconcile with the truth of the history. And I think that will resolve many of the problems we have. And I think the US also has a role. You, know, you can leave us alone, but I think you can do better by you know, making your own efforts to uh, uh, resolve these outstanding issues that divide from time to time Korea and Japan. Thank you very much. If I could turn to Professor Miyagi and, and the views from Tokyo. Well, I, I don't think I can represent any, anybody or any government in Japan. There is only one government, but um, probably I cannot, first of all, I cannot agree more. Uh, 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 with both of you, and I, I don't have to repeat what they have, they have said. So I, I like to give you, I, I think the microphone is a bit high. Could you lower it down? Um, I like to give you some, uh, my per, some of my personal perspectives about the situation in this part of the world. Because I studied Arabic uh, some 30 years ago in Cairo, and I, I think the world is getting smaller and smaller. Um, in the past, uh, there were two theaters of operation, one in the Middle East and one in uh, Asia or Asia Pacific. I, I don't think it's, it's the case anymore. Um, what, if, what if there are two, simultaneously, uh, two uh, major conflicts, one in the Middle East and one in East Asia. Probably in the past, the United States, everybody believed, could address that. But I think the world is getting smaller and the U.S. forces are getting smaller. And uh, in my view, I think the Middle East and East Asia are getting an more and more a one theater of operation than a separate independent thing. So uh, that's, that's one observation. So probably when we, we discuss the issue of the uh, Northeast Asia, it is not an independent separate thing. It is part of the what I dubbed Middle East Asia theater <coughs> as one. So we should have this kind of uh, uh, interregional or more broader sort of a perspective when, it, when, when we discuss the issue of uh, Northeast Asia. And number two, uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize the issue of governability uh, in our part of the world. It is pretty unfortunate. In a sense, the Cold War era was a 
uh, was good old days. It was so easy to govern. You have communists, you have enemy, and you have uh, your forces, and you have allies, and the world is much simpler, then things are going to be all right. But after the demise of the Soviet Union and all, the, all kinds of nationalism came back to the theater, and it is so difficult to handle. And ironically, democracies find it more difficult to handle uh, nationalism. Uh, probably uh, totalitarianism can, can handle nationalism better. Sometimes they take advantage of that as well. So uh, the situation, I, as I see it, in uh, the uh, East Asia is that the governments are getting, uh, 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 finding it more and more difficult to govern and handle the negative uh, aspects of the uh, nationalism in any country, not only in my country, in Korea and in China and probably elsewhere. So um, we have to um, make uh, those nationalism into patriotism. You see, the narrow-minded nationalism shouldn't be there. And what we need is a responsible and healthy patriotism with um, uh, uh, hearts of uh, statesmanship, not the uh, political ship, uh, uh, as uh, we witness in some of the countries even in East Asia. So uh, I think these are the um, views of my own, but uh, always have to uh, uh, I believe, keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your candid views. If I could bring two factors into the discussion right <coughs> now, there, there is uh, one interpretation here in Washington that with the movement of uh, conceptualization to implementation of the Asia-Pacific rebalancing, uh, that coupled with budget cuts and one perspective can be viewed as an important catalyst for increased trilateral uh, coordination among uh, the United States, uh, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, if I could start with you, Ambassador Jean, and some perspectives on that. Uh, this is a, a very current type of discussion going on, uh, and almost a priority if viewed from the perspective of how to uh, align these different factors uh, and deal with something that will be with us for many years to come. The budget cuts are not a momentary uh, instance in time, but something that we'll, we'll have to deal with uh, for uh, years to come. Well, I don't want to interfere with uh, American domestic politics, and I think there should be a reason. I wish you would. <laughs> <laughs> I think there should be a sound reason to to uh, cut your budget. But uh, um, I think, uh, and I hope that uh, uh, your Congress will pay due attention to the rising importance of East Asia, not only for. Uh, U.S. economic interest in the future, but uh, for national security interest as well. And uh, uh, whatever reasons uh, U.S. Congress may have to cut budgets, uh, overall budget may be to, to recover the health of the U.S. economy, I suppose. But uh, uh, I hope that this will not impact on uh, U.S. commitment to uh, East Asia, you know, security commitment, uh, and political commitment. And I think re I, I, I'm inclined to see rebalancing as a natural corollary, corollary of the evolution of the structure of U.S. interests you know, and the recognition of the rising importance of East Asia in U.S. foreign policy. So uh, I'm not surprised by that. And I don't, uh, I think it could have done without great fanfare. But uh, I think uh, uh, I'm not surprised by uh, this adjustment of U.S. Uh, foreign policy priorities. But um, if this commitment is going to be credible, I think it should be uh, um, backed by sustained political support from Congress. And I think budgetary support is most tangible uh, token of political support, sustained political support to 
rebalancing. That's, if, uh, if you may, uh, uh, what I would like to say about this uh, uh, rebalancing. Thank you very much. It's to see in the region, uh, Professor Yaki. Yeah, um, first of all, rebalancing is welcomed in Asia, while it's not always welcomed in the Middle East. If you talk to the Middle East, Middle East hands in this country or elsewhere, they are, they are so mad. Why? Why rebalancing to Asia? We are losing our friends in the Middle East. This is the uh, simple, uh, typical uh, reaction when you talk to the Middle East hands in this country, especially in, in Washington. So, uh, so probably uh, we are lucky that Americans are back, or some people say, well, we never left Asia. Probably so. But that, probably that's not the issue. The issue, the real issue is this, as I explained to you before, earlier today, the, 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 the theater is shrinking, and Middle East, East Asia are becoming one theater. But you may have multiple crises, which, which may require intervention. Um, and what will happen? Uh, I explained this situation to my uh, Japanese audience in Tokyo uh, like this. What if we have a crisis in the, in the Gulf area? And what if we have another somewhere in the South China Sea? What would happen? And um, probably um, we may have to make a decision. Well, the Pentagon people will, will not accept it, but the, I, I tell my audience we have to make a decision. Where should we, or should the United States send their troops? And in the worst case scenario, we may have to send uh, the troops to the Gulf, not South China Sea. So that means, um, Despite the policy of rebalancing to Asia, but depending on, of course, the situation in the Middle East, but there are, there will be uh, cases when uh, the Americans are invited back to the back to back to the Middle East. So that means that will create um, an insufficient level of deterrence in our part of the world. And we have to address that issue. How we do that? Probably that will be a collect. We need a collective effort to supplement, if necessary, the level of deterrence among the allies of the United States and friends in 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 uh, uh, East Asia and the Pacific region. Um, Probably, uh, I cannot go into details because uh, uh, I do not know much about the details of the, of the plans. But definitely, uh, there will be a day when something like that could happen. But in order to do that, in order to cope with that kind of situation, probably um, uh, for unlike uh, uh, U.S., South Korea, uh, Japan coordination, or maybe coordination among other groups of countries might be necessary. And I think this is, uh, uh, should be considered as part of the rebalancing policy. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Hadley, if I could turn to you, uh, out of those two factors, the Asia-Pacific rebalancing and budget cuts, uh, the second is certainly not new. And in your experience, having gone through different cycles of budget cuts, how would you square uh, these challenges and opportunities now for the United States uh, in Northeast Asia in this current configuration? You know, I'm not, I'm not worried, as worried about the budget cuts as you might uh, think. Um, the, um, I'm also not a particular fan of the rebalance to Asia as, as to um, how it was managed. Uh, I, I agree with, I think it should have been done with less fanfare he never left Asia. The notion that we had to pivot to Asia, you know, um, we never left. We've always been there. 
uh, and the emphasis, I think, the fanfare both um, uh, was a problem for China and was a problem for our allies. And I think most allies would say, why didn't you just do it and not talk about it? Secondly, the military component of it is actually quite small. Um, and, and also, I, I think, to lead with the military, you know, the coin of the realm in Asia is economics. And if you want to consolidate uh, our leadership in Asia, we need to fix our budget, fix our deficit, get our economy going, and get in the dialogue about trade agreements. You know, Asia is locking itself up in a series of trade arrangements that has the United States largely on the outside. Uh, you know, in the middle of all of this, for you know, China, Japan, South Korea to having a trilateral free trade discussion is remarkable. So I think um, the name of the game in Asia is economics, and the United States needs to make itself once again a, uh, a player in Asia. So that is the shift I would put. But because the military piece of it is fairly small, and because the administration has been so public about it, I think at, to this point, and there are people who can speak more authoritatively, uh, every time I've heard American officials talk about, you know, their budget, the kind they've said, but maintaining our force capability in Asia is a priority. So I, and I, I believe them, and I think it will be a priority. That said, the case for greater defense cooperation among the three is self-evident, even without a budget crunch on the United States. It'll simply be more effective the kinds of problems posed by the ballistic missile problem coming out of North Korea is one that requires a networked solutions of lots of different um, uh, lots of different radars and other intelligence and surveillance assets being pooled together and able to, and, and able to enable interceptors from a number of different locations. That's how you do a defense against a ballistic missile threat. And that emphasizes data sharing, interoperability of, uh, of equipment, and a networked approach. So put aside the budget issue. It just makes good, solid national security policy. And that's why I think, um, as you were saying earlier, the, the efforts that were made to enhance data sharing and intelligence cooperation with South Korea and Japan, uh, making enormous sense as part of this whole uh, effort. So, of course, we should be doing those things. It is cheaper, but more to the point, it will provide a better defense for all of us against the uncertainty, security uncertainties that come from, from the, the area. Thank you. If I can move into the final uh, round of questions, and we'll open up uh, to Q&A with the group here. Uh, Mr. Hadley, as you touched on North Korea, uh, it, it in, uh, for me, it uh, raises the point that has been mentioned in, in a number of different fora, how uh, it is a very unique collection of countries who can provide in this global system of uh, supply and demand of security and stability, three countries that have been uniquely suited and have had a large footprint in terms of providing security and stability. As it relates to North Korea, as we've seen with the headlines today as well, uh, North Korea is going down the continued path of uh, not doing denuclearization, not returning to the Six Party Talks, uh, continuing with its version of, of trade. In this case, the initial reports are that it looked like a shipment of armaments that were being brought back to North Korea for repair uh, in return for a uh, shipment of sugar. Uh, it's still early, early days, but those are the initial reports. With North Korea in this particular configuration, in this particular direction, to the group, uh, as the provider, uh, supplier of security and stability, how will the trilateral partnership uh, deal with uh, a North Korea that is going in a different direction and evolving into a more serious, a clear and direct threat as international media has uh, framed North Korea? And if I could start with Professor Miyaki. Well, I'm not an expert on uh, North Korean affairs, but uh, I only visited Pyongyang once, so I'm not a good uh, person to ask. But uh, my personal observation is the following. Uh, first of all, we were so alarmed when, when uh, 
uh, Kim Jong-un took over. He's a grandson of a founder of a small family business. And the grandfather or father knew that it's a small family business. But our biggest worry a few, uh, some time ago was whether the grandson really understands that this is just a small country, small co corporation, as if, if, if he felt that he had in inherited a large corporation, blue chip corporation, that could be a big mistake and a, a source of miscalculation. So we were so worried about it. Then eventually, my observation is that, aha, uh -huh, this grandson is beginning to understand the basic pattern of the game. It's the uh, coercive, uh, assertive, then you did try your best and you get nothing, then you change your attitude and get uh, 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 smiling faces, and uh, then eventually you get something, and then you get tough again. This kind of circle, sort of a, a rotational um, game. Um, we were sick and tired of those, but at least this grandson and seems to understand that pattern, then probably it, it, he gets more uh, uh, predictable, unfortunately. That's probably uh, what uh, we are witnessing now. And I hope that um, at least uh, the grandson understands the old pattern of the game. But having said that, um, the North Korean uh, uh, issue is, is becoming a real uh, threat. To, to the Japanese uh, uh, security. That's a, that's a reality, and we are feeling it uh, 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 every year. Then, um, probably people in this, in this room may know, but um, you ha we have uh, United Nations uh, Command RIA headquarters in Camp Zama, and we have United Nations forces uh, uh, sort of usable uh, uh, facilities and areas. We have UN uh, uh, status of forces agreement. So we are part of, part of the uh, uh, formation vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis the North. Uh, uh, we are tightly connected to the defense uh, posture of uh, uh, of South Korea. Uh, this, I think this is the reality and we should keep in mind. Yeah. Turn to Ambassador Chan. Well, uh, let me uh, comment on uh, what uh, Mr. Hadley said about uh, uh, security cooperation uh, among the three uh, countries represented here. Um, well, this is uh, the notion of security cooperation between Korea and Japan is not a very popular uh, idea in Korea. Nevertheless, uh, you know, President Lee Myung Bak, uh, he uh, wanted to uh, fundamentally upgrade Korea-Japan relationship, uh, not only through a conclusion, the conclusion of an FTA, bilateral FTA with Japan, but by embarking on security cooperation. And we thought that the easiest things to do was to uh, reach agreements on intelligence, military intelligence sharing, and logistic support. And we have been doing this with many other countries. So I thought this is uh, uh, something we could do only if Japan uh, is ready to alleviate our domestic political burden by resolving the easiest outstanding issue uh, between Korea and Japan, namely comfort woman case. We thought this is, uh, there are only a, a, you know, a, a couple dozen comfort women living and uh, this is, uh, uh, we have a time constraints and I think there is a, a relatively small political burden on Japan. And if there is a political will and strategic vision for Japan to uh, live with some uh, 
opposition in Japan uh, for the sake of broader uh, security interests for Japan, for Korea. I thought this is a feasible idea. But uh, I've, I was mistaken, and uh, I, I advised strongly, strongly the, pres the president to go in that direction, and he, he approved, but somehow I miserably failed in this uh, attempt. Uh, I think there is still a chance uh, if uh, we can, we find a way to uh, deal with uh, the, the issue of history uh, in a uh, wise manner. Uh, and I think uh, this is time uh, we need that kind of cooperation. But I'm not sure whether uh, President Park will take the risk of uh, trying that again. Because uh, I need to defend my former national national security advisors stick together. You know we're kind of a small club, <laughs> and you 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 had the right instant in, insight because you could not get the co cooperation on the comfort women that you needed. You decided to separate it. You sent the agreements forward without that political cover, mm -hmm. and they failed. That's right. So you know the conception was right. The execution did not work. Um, but, you know, I, I just, too much self-flagellation here is not, not in order here. Uh, you had a strong concept. But it shows the problem of how we've got to find a way to work these history and national issues so that they don't get in the way of sensible progress in order to deal with, uh, you know, real national security issues. This isn't a fault and blame business. This is two countries learning out, going to have to learn how to manage this history and nationalism so it doesn't get in the way of going forward. And that's, what you, that's really what the kinds of conversations we can have in this room can help try to develop those mechanisms for dealing with that problem. So, so at the time, at the, time the, the Korean general public was not ready to digest that kind of uh, uh, pills. No, I, would, I don't know whether that would be the right yeah. uh, description, but, uh, uh, but I think I, I would not give up hope on that. And, uh, uh, but it takes a strong leadership, both in, in Japan and Korea, if we are and going to may, make any progress. And it may, I'm just jumping in here, which is, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get between two friends who are not getting along because sometimes they end up just each beating on you and they're doing fine. But one of the questions I think you have to think about is trying to pre-coordinate your moves. Let, let me, let so me, there, so okay. there is no surprises and you have something that both countries think is going to work because you can't do this kind of unilaterally. You've really got to have an understanding. If I do this, are you going to be able in a position to do this? What can I do to help give you political cover for the step you need to make? And what can you do to help give political cover for the step I make? That, I think, is the kind of, you know, kind of thing you have to do when you're going to make these moves. You know, I tried, the... I tried, I failed. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, I explain to you why. Uh, I was uh, in the uh, North America Bureau, uh, National Security Affairs Division, uh, Deputy Director, back in the 80s. Now, at that time, uh, probably, I, I'm just trying to explain to uh, Americans especially, because the Koreans and Japanese uh, should know and sh should be aware of that. But in the past, the, uh, actually, the tripartite cooperation or discussion was much, much more smooth. And of course, there were difficulties all the time. You know, we have been troubles uh, over the past 1,000 years or something. But as compared to now, things were much, much different in the 80s and even 90s. And uh, uh, the biggest difference between the 80s, 90s, and now is the lack of political uh, channel or communication between the politicians. You know, in, in the past, and we still have a uh, uh, Parliamentarians League for uh, Japan, uh, ROK, Friendship, which is a huge organization. 
But uh, in the past, uh, the, mm, uh, we have many, many senior, seasoned, experienced politicians, LDP and uh, other parties alike, uh, join the association. And they have a good amount of uh, number of uh, uh, counterparts in Korea. And they frequently visit each other. And they had very serious informal exchange of views on how to handle the bilateral relationship. But unfortunately, for many reasons I, I, I uh, cannot explain uh, in a short period of time, we are losing it. We don't have our informal uh, politicians level contacts between the two nations. And which is one of the reasons is that, of course, because of the difficulties, I admit. But at the same time, um, the, there are some generational change. And, uh, not, and especially the change of the uh, politicians, uh, parliamentarians, uh, they're changing rapidly. Every few years, you know, people come and go. So unfortunately, they don't, <laughs> we don't have many sort of uh, serious, like-minded uh, politicians in both in ROK and uh, uh, Japan uh, the, in recent uh, years, which really uh, uh, annoys me. That's one of the reasons, yes, but uh, uh, one of the reasons that we, we cannot put all the blame well, I'm not blaming, yeah. but the, the groundwork you, yes, you right. said, this is right. extremely important. I take your have. point, and generational change, and I think a lack of uh, uh, channels uh, among the uh, senior parliamentarians, politicians, that's, uh, that's one problem. But uh, it's easier to manage existing relations than trying to upgrade fundamentally the, the quality uh, of relations between the two countries. And, and, uh, concluding an FTA with Japan, concluding and getting into a uh, military cooperation, security cooperation into, uh, with Japan. This is a totally new territory and very dangerous territory unless we, uh, you know, do the groundwork, you know, yeah. right. I so, under the Cold War, it was easier. It Maybe. is, but the point I think is right because what you need to show to your two peoples is that there is a potential difference in the relationship. There is an upside to the relationship. And many times you have to do that with a big signature program of cooperation that will capture people's attention and capture people's imagination. And that's what you were trying to do. We had that experience with India, where our relationships were not good for 30 years. And the much criticized by some nuclear agreement played that role in U.S.-India relations. It was something the Indians really thought was important to their future. The United States was willing to facilitate. We entered into the agreement and really had a transformative effect, both in the United States and India, about what the potential for the relationship could be. It has not worked out the way we would all have wanted. But thinking strategically about how you can change the perceptions of one's people about the relationships so that the focus is not so much on the past, but you can give them to focus something on the future. But those are big undertakings. And they're, they've got to be done, I think, with a... They've got to be pre-rired and pre-worked through by the two countries in a way that you're going to cover each other and make it work for each leader in both countries. That takes ongoing work and the kind of ongoing relationships at all levels that you were talking about. And without that, it gets right. very hard I, to do. I, I totally but, agree with but you. But that's the kind of thinking and that's the kind of opportunity that, um, uh, that Prime Minister Abe and, and President Park, I think, have. They are now both strong leaders and I would hope that they've got a couple people in whom they have confidence who are quietly talking about the relationship and seeing whether there aren't a potential for them earlier in their term to, to, to give that kind of signal for the two peoples. That's what I hope is, is going yeah, on. Unfortunately, the bilateral relationship uh, is more 
domestic. In, in the United States, you say all yeah. politics is local. I say most diplomacy is domestic. Yeah. And uh, in the case of uh, Japan-Korea relations, unfortunately, the domestic element is becoming larger and larger and, and more, more important. Yeah. And uh, those nationalisms really prevent the political leaders from thinking the way you, you, you described. Well, I think it's trilateral. It's not about uh, Korea-Japan relations <laughs> only. So uh, I, I, let me touch on, if you uh, allow me, touch on the issue of North Korea that uh, uh, Mr. Hadley raised earlier. Um, well, the, the shipping, uh, the seizure of the North Korean ship in, uh, in Panama reminds us the, the, the stark realities we are facing with North Korea. And, you know, I have uh, devoted uh, many years of my career negotiating with North Korea, in the six-party talks. And um, uh, we all know that denuclearization of North Korea is an extremely difficult task, and uh, there is very slim chance of uh, achieving that goal. But I think it's too early to give up on that goal and just uh, dismiss it as an impossibility. Uh, but if we are going to achieve or, or have any chance of achieving that goal, I think we need at least two things. One is uh, we have to strengthen existing sanctions. Security Council sanctions are not biting enough. They will not change North Korean calculations. So I think they can, they can live with existing sanctions. There'll be some uh, damage to the North Korean economy, but I think North Korea can bear that kind of burden. And as the Panama uh, incident has shown, we, can, we still have a room uh, to tighten the existing sanctions. Uh, especially in the area of shipping. We can crack down on North Korean shipping. And this was included in the draft Security Council resolution, but had to be uh, uh, dropped because of uh, China's opposition, I, I know. But, you know, if this is not possible through the Security Council resolution, I think we need a coalition of the willing to uh, implement uh, supplementary sanctions on North Korea. I don't believe that sanctions uh, are a panacea and they will resolve the North Korean problem. Sanctions themselves will not resolve our problem. What the sanctions do is to change North Korea's strategic calculation that nuclear weapons is not a source of their salvation. You know, it's no longer a holy, holy grail of their regime. But this will be the the thing that will throw them into uh, the grave. We have to change their perception, their calculation, and nuclear weapons themselves will be the most dangerous thing for the regime's survival. That should be the perception. And we can do that by strengthening sanctions, by increasing the in insurance premium for North Korea to an unbearable point if they consider nuclear weapons as uh, an insurance policy for survival. And uh, another thing is, if sanctions that you know, tr on the basis of trilateral or, you know, and uh, with a broader coalition with the European Union and other uh, like-minded countries is going to work, we have to prevent China from undercutting our effort. And if we can do that, I know that uh, China is uh, more cooperative than before, even though I don't believe that they will fundamentally change their policy toward North Korea. But I think, uh, you know, U.S. has uh, more means than any other countries to uh, change China's uh, position and on this issue. So, yeah, I, so I, 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 sorry, I, I still believe that there is a, a glimmer of hope that we can peacefully I don't say diplomatically, but peacefully uh, 
resolve the North Korean nuclear, denuclearize North Korea. So I think we can do more. And if uh, the U.S. and other countries, like-minded countries, have the political will to do as much as they do with Iran, which is not yet developing nuclear weapons, toward North Korea, I think uh, we can change North Korea's calculations. Do you agree with that or not? I, I do. I do. Uh, well, um, I think the uh, the objective is right. We've got to convince this green regime that their current course leads to ruin. That it does not guarantee the stability of the regime, but in the end, it ultimately threatens the stability of the regime because that's really all this regime cares about is its own survival. It's made that absolutely clear. I think there are a lot of ways to do that. First of all, I, I go back to this defense cooperation, ballistic missile defense co cooperation that assures all of our publics that North Korea's current activities cannot threaten them. And we've made a good start. We've done it more bilaterally than we have trilaterally. I think you need to do it trilaterally intensifying. To reassure our populations, it's the responsibility we have to our people to keep them safe, but also to send the message to North Korea, you know, you're spending a whole lot of money, you're mortgaging your economy and your future on something that isn't going to work. Because it's not going to be able to hurt us and it's not going to be able to blackmail us. Um, secondly, I think coordinating sanctions is right. I think that's an important thing we can do. Secondly, we've got to stop bribing them which I think we've largely gotten out of our system after two decades. Um, remember, that we got the attention of the North Korea issue, finally, on the nuclear issue, when we sold, when we froze $25 million of Kim Jong-il's assets through Bank of Delta Asia. That's when we really got their attention. And I would really have a full court press to get after the regime's money that they've all got stashed in Switzerland and elsewhere. And once you get a hold of that money, their own personal assets, you're going to get a lot more attention to this. I think we've got to do some things that may be uncomfortable to some of our allies. I think we've got to make a big campaign to expose the human rights abuses so the world knows what this regime is like and so that the Korean people as much as possible know what this regime is like uh, and we need to get more information into uh, the regime. Uh, I think China has changed. Uh, I think that's something that's come out of the most recent summit. I think we need China to do all it can to try to convince this regime to start changing its economic system, to do some real reforms. I think that will begin to open up the system. Uh, so I think we, we um, have a long-term problem strategy that denies them the benefits of their investment in the nuclear program, puts enormous pressure on the regime to show them that they are headed for the dustbin of history, so unless the they're willing to make a change. And then, as we did in the Structure Six Party to Talks, to say, if you are willing to make a change, we're willing to change your, <laughs> your future. There's got to be, I think, that promise that if they will give up that program, the world is ready to engage. Um, but, you know, otherwise, you know, this, this country is, uh, is going nowhere. I, I basically agree with you. But uh, let me make some comments on China, because China has a key. Yes. You know, when I was posted in Beijing uh, about 10 years ago, they were already talking about uh, the, the possibility of a changing policy vis-a-vis -vis DPRK. And uh, some lim only limited number of people were talking about the liability of DPRK uh, for, for China. But uh, at that time, it was very, very uh, small number of voices. Um, only limited people, a uh, number of people were talking about it. But recently, as you have witnessed, we have more voices and uh, uh, vocal and uh, uh, public voice is, is there. But still, Chinese change 
uh, of policy recently we witnessed is tactical. It's not strategic yet. And um, so if, if they strategically think that they should change, oh, they could lose a DPRK as a buffer state, then that would be a big thing. But I don't think it, it's going to happen uh, automatically easily. Because if I were a Chinese leader, then say, look, we don't need DPLK anymore. But OK, we, when, when we talk about the fall of North Korea, there are two kinds of fall. One is the fall of the Kim dynasty. And the second is the fall of DPLK. They are two different things. If I were a Chinese leader, a smart Chinese leader, I, I would change the dynasty while retaining DPLK. So China has many, many options, but uh, they are not ready to make a strategic decision yet. And I think one of the things uh, along this that uh, several of administrations have tried is there is that fear in China, well, what happens if, if DPRK really starts to crumble? What does that look like? What does it threaten for China in terms of refugee flows and all the rest? And how will South Korea and the United States react and maybe take advantage of it? And I think um, that is a conversation the South Koreans are nervous about having with anybody other than themselves, even us. Um, the Chinese don't want to have a murmur of that conversation. I think uh, we need to get over that, all of us. And we need, and I would do it trilaterally, have a conversation of what would a meltdown of that regime begin to look like? How would we respond to it? Um, how would we manage it? How, we, what, how would we take into account Chinese sens sensibilities about it? And I think we need to get to the point where very quietly we can have that kind of conversation with China because I think it will facilitate the kind of policy uh, we all think we should be pursuing with China. If, Ch if China can have some greater understanding and, and reassurance about what happens when this thing goes bad, and I think the chances are it will. That is to say, this regime, I just don't see lasting generation to generation. It, we'll see whether it can make this transition. So I think one of the things that would facilitate all this is the kind of conversation, quiet conversation, out of the, uh, out of the headlines. You know, what, it, what happens if this um, regime starts to unwind? How can we make a safe landing so that in the end of the day, it is a more peaceful and prosperous Northeast Asia, Asia rather than a Northeast Asia that gets plunged into crisis. We need a very serious strategic dialogue with, uh, we do. with China about the final outcome of what could happen in North Korea and uh, assure them uh, about uh, their concerns, you know, that their concerns can be handled properly and uh, uh, their strategic interest will uh, will not uh, suffer as a result of uh, uh, unification. So these kind of things will have to be discussed quietly in, right. a, uh, in a discreet manner uh, with China. And I agree with you that, uh, that uh, apart from, the, from more onerous sanctions, fighting sanctions, we need uh, to invest more in offensive and defensive military capabilities to counter yeah. North Korean uh, nuclear and missile threats. And that's, uh, that's what I, uh, while I was in office, I was trying very hard to, uh, to do. And uh, yeah. the, the amendment of uh, ROK missile guidelines that uh, uh, I uh, was deeply involved in uh, was, um, uh, in that regard, uh, a very positive step forward in building our offensive capabilities. And I, I know that we need to invest more in defensive capabilities to counter, to, uh, to uh, intercept uh, incoming North Korean missiles that could be, we do not know which one would be uh, tipped with uh, nuclear devices. We do not know when 
they will be able to reach the stage, te technical, technological stage, they can uh, you know, mount their uh, nuclear weapons on missiles. We don't know if they have already done that, but we have to uh, get them to know that all those investments at the expense of the daily life, well-being of the North Korean, the North Korean people would be in vain. And by enhancing our deterrence and offensive and defensive capabilities, we can you know, convince North Koreans that, that these are nuclear weapons are useless. They do not enhance their own security. So we, can, we have to do all these things together, and I think stronger sanctions will give them also stronger incentives to get serious, to become more serious about uh, you know, negotiations. So negotiations without stronger sanctions will be just a waste of time, in my view. If I could jump in at this point, we'll have plenty of opportunities uh, to carry on these different threads with the Q&A. I was a little worried coming into this panel discussion that our panelists would have little to say and that there would be awkward pauses and, and silences. So that this is I'm a, sorry. <laughs> this has been a, a great group discussion here, a panel discussion. Let me open it up now to the audience. If you could come to either of the microphones uh, to your left and your right, uh, if you could state your name and your affiliation uh, and also who you'd like to direct your question to, uh, please uh, come on up. Hi, my name is Takashi Oshima from the Japanese newspaper Sahih Shimbun. Um, my question is regarding the um, future possibility of the unification of the Korean Peninsula and the U.S. military presence. I remember that before the President Im Im Park leave the Blue House a couple months ago, he had an interview with the Donga Iribo, and uh, in that interview, he said that uh, President Im Park talked with the Chinese President Hu Xintao about the uh, future, how the future unification look like. And uh, also he said that he talked with Chinese leader about the uh, US military presence. I mean, uh, as you know, the, the main concern of the Chinese side is China see North Korea somehow the, some sort of buffer to the United States. You, they, they don't want to face with the US military with the border. So uh, my question is, does South Korea or United States should talk with the China more realistically about the, how the unified Korea look like and how the U.S. military presence will be in the case of the unified Korea. That's my question. Well, I think that's well, between uh, China and, and well, uh, yeah, you are right that uh, in summit meeting between uh, President Lee Meng-bak and Chinese leaders. Uh, I know that I was there when President Lee raised the issue of unification. That you know, we try to convince uh, Chinese leadership that uh, they have everything to benefit from unification and, and uh, sharing uh, a common border with unified Korea will not be a uh, uh, will not be detrimental to China's strategic interests. So we try to convince that unification is good for China. It's not a bad thing for China. Uh, I don't know how, you know, China's thinking is evolving, but uh, when there is an opportunity, we try to, to persuade them that, uh, uh, and try to get them ready psychologically, you know, for unification, and there should we want to alleviate whatever concerns they may have about unified Korea. So, uh, at every opportunity, we try to do that. I, I'm not sure how much, how successful we we have been thus far, but.